Academy. How'd you like that new intro? I figured some, you know, some music will get you guys pumped up, ready to go. I want you to be ready for this training. We are in week one, lesson four. It's all about recruiting and hiring. Stop making the common mistakes every freaking manager makes on recruiting and hiring. Stop wasting your time screening hundreds of applicants, you know, interviewing tens of twenties of applicants, even hundreds, trying to find one key position, and then it just doesn't work out. Stop what you're doing right now. It's not working. I've I have hired hundreds, if not thousands of people through my retail career. I have made all the mistakes that you are making right now. So stop it. <laughs> I am going to walk you through pr just proven principles that are going to help you actually find the right people and help you build that high performance team. The most important part of running a store, if you want your store to be successful, you first have to have the right team. One. Just one great hire can cha completely change the direction of your store. Imagine if your whole team are a team of great hires. You will be unstoppable. All right, now I'm just going to recap. I'm just going to basically introduce you to what we're going to, going to learn in this lesson, what we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss some recruiting techniques that will help you find exactly what you're looking for without holding a career fair. Stop, stop, stop paying for a career fair, number one. Stop wasting your time attending these things and talking to people and handing out business cards and handing out pens with the business name on it. You're wasting your time. I don't care if you're recruiting engineers from an engineer school. It doesn't work. Stop wasting your time on career fairs. That's old school. That's 1950s. We are in 2017. Some of you watching this, it's going to be 2018. Stop doing career fairs. It doesn't work. Everybody's on their phones. Everybody's on LinkedIn. You don't need a career fair. You can literally target all the people you want that are bet the most qualified for the position on LinkedIn with a simple search. Why, why would you wait for people to come to you? Go to them where they are at. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here. You guys got to bring me back in. All right, so back to what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to discuss interviewing tech. We're going to discuss interviewing tips that actually bring out the truth and show it'll help you really see their character. Then we're then at the end of this lesson, we're going to discuss what I call a mutually agreeable contract that will help both the employee and the employer, you be on the same page. All right, let's get right to it. Have you ever hundred, have you ever hot, sorry, have you ever interviewed or have you ever had a hundred applicants come in your hiring portal and not a, not a single applicant was worth interviewing? I can't tell you how many times that happens every single day. I know you've probably seen that day in and day out. You just have these worthless applicants that are applying. It doesn't work, guys, stop. Oh my goodness, stop counting on your, your hiring por portal to find good applicants. They are a dime a dozen. You're not going to find them, okay? Stop it. <laughs> uh, let me skip through these. These are blah, blah, blah. Managers are experiencing this right now. It's right. It's, it's frustrating, okay? I'd like to take a more proactive approach on recruiting that starts well before you have an, o an open position. Now, some of you have a position you're trying to fill right now, okay? I understand that, but pro you've got to be proactive. You should not be having these knee-jerk reactions every other week, every other month, trying to fill in these key positions. You need to take a proactive approach. This, this, this is all cup. We talk about this concept throughout the entire Store Manager Academy about being a forward thinker. All the great managers that I know that all the ones that are successful are forward thinkers. Start thinking about the future. Stop thinking about the now. You live in the now, but you plan for the future. You work in the now, but you plan 
for the future, okay? So it's very important that you start building a bench, okay? You need to determine how big of a bench you need and what you can afford to keep on your payroll. Obviously, that's important. You starts with evaluating your current staff and selecting individuals that can be groomed for those future positions. But I want you to remember this. You can't just start grooming people without them knowing. Okay, it's important that you let each individual know you want them to be on the bench for that position. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you a perfect example. I had a great part-time hourly associate that was just phenomenal. Just they put their best work in everything that they did. They're very smart, forward thinking, and and probably to their demise. And I'll tell you why in a second, the, the forward thinking part. Um, I was about to lose a department manager. I had, I had a month notice. They were moving out of state, going to school. And so I was, I had this hourly associate that was a phenomenal backup that I believed would do a better job than the current department manager. So I started giving that person more responsibility and a couple more hours each, each week. And I knew that that person eventually knew that the department manager was leaving and he got wind that I was going to offer him the position. He, he heard that from the department manager because I said, hey, department manager, start grooming this guy because I want him to be considered your, you know, I want to consider him for your replacement. And I hadn't talked to that employee yet if, if they actually wanted the position. I just assumed that he wanted it. Well, as soon as he got wind of that position, that it was going to be offered to him, he stopped showing up for work. He stopped showing up. I didn't see the guy for two weeks. I thought he died. Like this was not normal. He never missed a day in his life. So he comes in when it's, guess what day he comes in? Payday, right? And I'm like, hey, dude, what the heck happened? Like you were, I was considering you for a full-time position. You were going to get a fat pay increase with benefits, vacation, everything. And you just freaking dropped off the map. And he's like, well, Steven, I really wasn't interested in the position. You know, I was happy with the income I was making. It fit perfectly with the food stamps I was receiving from the state and the monthly subsidies and blah, blah, blah for my kids. And I'm like, wow, you seriously gave up a full-time job with benefits so you could stay on the nanny state's payroll? I mean, I didn't say it that way, but oh my gosh, that's I'm, I'm getting too political here, but just back to the principle of letting that person know that you want to groom them for the position you want them on the bench because some will tell you that they won't they don't want the position surprise <laughs> all right so let's go into a couple rules of recruiting the best people you can hire are those already employed listen to this again the best people you can hire are those that are already employed. Do that's that's why you get 100 applicants in your in your little system and not a single one of them are qualified for the position. They're all just worthless people that are not going to work for you, right? They're going to do a crappy job and you end up firing them a week or two later or they fire themselves cuz they show up every other shift drunk, okay? The best people you are going to find out there have jobs this proves to be true <laughs> generally speaking anyone who's worth hiring probably has a job already now it's not always the case right there there are a few people out there that maybe are just in between opportunities but they are far and few right this this proves to be true that people that are already employed are the best people to hire some of the best recruiting comes from so let's so I'm going to I'm going to switch gears a little bit here so how do you find people that are already hired well the best recruiting comes from from purposely going out and shopping the competition and then contacting the employee you were most impressed with and inviting them in for an interview i have contributed to many of my competitors closing their doors because I relentlessly recruited all of their top talent on a regular basis. Think about this. What's your business comprised of besides the product? 
It's your people. It's your human capital. They're the ones that are driving the business. They're the ones that are merchandising, stocking the shelves, keeping the store clean. They're the ones actually talking to your customers, selling to your customers, doing add-ons, checking them out at the register, taking their actual money and putting it in the register. Okay. When you take away your competitor's top talent, they're left with average talent and even below talent individuals. Customers recognize when a, when a business is, uh, is not doing great, when their service is crappy. When someone receives crappy service, if they don't absolutely have to shop at that store, which I, I can't think of any stores these days where someone has, doesn't have another option. Maybe if you live in a town of a thousand people, you know, and you're a hundred miles away from any, any, any other civilization, maybe that will apply. But generally speaking, they will stop shopping that store because they're not receiving great service and they can get better service down the street or across the street or even in the same complex. That's why recruiting your, recruiting your competitions, top talent relentlessly, is going to help you be extremely successful as a business. You're going to bring that customer customer base over to your store with that top talent. It's not going to happen overnight, but I can tell you it will happen in a matter of months very quickly when it, when you're looking at the larger play here. All right. Now let's move on to rule number two. There are two truths. Most people don't completely love or hate their job. Think about that for a minute. When you're out there recruiting somebody from another business, most people don't completely love or hate their job. There are a few people that do, but most, that's the key word here, most people don't completely love or hate their job. I wanna prove this to you with an example. If you could live anywhere in the world and your family could be with you, income wasn't an issue, where would you live? Most of you would not stay where you live right now. You wouldn't say, I'm happy where I'm at. No, you'd be like, oh, I want to live in Costa Rica. That's where I, personally, that's where I would love to live, Costa Rica. Or maybe you want to live in Hawaii. Maybe you want to live in North Dakota. Probably not, right? Maybe you want to live in New York. I don't know. But nine times out of 10, it's not where you are right now. And that's why these two truths are so true. No, most people don't completely love or hate their job. Understanding these two truths will help you move forward in confidence when you start recruiting from your competitors. It makes sense, right? Have that confidence, know, understand, know and believe these two truths and you're going to be very successful in your recruiting efforts. Now, rule number three, last rule when it comes to recruiting, LinkedIn works. Everyone is on LinkedIn. You, if you aren't on LinkedIn, you probably you probably don't take your retail career seriously. I and mean, let's be honest, if you're not linked on LinkedIn, you don't take your retail career seriously, or you're just in a different age demographic that doesn't is you know not using the internet as often, which is very rare these days. Everybody's using the internet, so LinkedIn works. LinkedIn is an incredible resource for finding talented individuals in your area, and it becomes very easy to reach out. I mean, think about this. You can literally go to every person that has, if you're looking for a front counter manager, a CSM, customer service manager, you literally can just type that in, set the zip code or the county or the city, the state, whatever you want, and hit search. And it's gonna pull up everybody that fits that, that, that search that you set in. It's so simple. If you link, use in, uh, use a, uh, it's a premium service with LinkedIn called LinkedIn Helper. Whew, if you if you use LinkedIn Helper, you're net. If you're trying for your management positions, you will never have a problem finding and filling those key positions. I promise you that. Use LinkedIn Helper if you if you can afford it. If not, there's a, I think there's a 30 day free trial. You can give that a try. But you can still do link the free LinkedIn version and still crush it on your recruiting. Okay. You can quickly screen dozens of qualified people, right? It's just you can go through their profile, look at their history, how long they've been with that company, what what were their accomplishments, who endorsed them. It's so easy to screen. It's literally their resume live being updated on a regular basis. 
It's the best way to screen qualified people, all right? <clears throat> now, when you do find some solid applicants on LinkedIn, you connect with them, right? You just add a friend request, if you want to call it that. No, it's not called friend request on LinkedIn. It's just a connection, right? But, and once they accept the connection, you send them a simple message like, hey, good afternoon, John. I wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. I am the store manager at XYZ Company and I'm hiring sales and customer service managers locally. At this time, I'm trying to identify an individual for a front counter position that I am currently recruiting on. I'm looking for someone who has a background somewhat similar to yours, hint, hint, you. I would really like to get a chance to discuss this position with you in more detail with the hope that you would be open to networking with me. You may know someone in your professional network that might be interested in hearing more about this opportunity. If you are not interested in speaking at this time, I understand. Please disregard this message. However, I'm hoping you would be open to networking and that I will hear from you soon. Look at that message again. What, what just happened there? Number one, I just told this individual that I'm recruiting someone with their skill sets, with their background, and I'd like to talk to you. Number two, I'm saying if it's if, if you don't care about, if you really don't want to, if you're not interested in XYZ company at all, you're not remotely interested at all, well, that's okay. You, I'm sure you know someone that might be interested. Would you refer them to me? It's a very professional message. It's to the point. I receive messages like this every single week from recruiters. I've been recruited. I've, I've, this, this messages like this have got me to work for other organizations because I was like, you know, hey, I just, I feel really important. You just, you're reaching out to me. You're impressed with my background. We haven't even spoken on the phone. You haven't seen my resume. You've just seen my LinkedIn profile. And here you're, you want to talk to me. That's fantastic. Now there's, I, I can't tell you the amount of emails I get like this that I just delete. And it's not because it's a crappy email. It's because I'm not interested in working at XYZ company. I've never been and I probably won't be. And that's OK. But I have sent hundreds of referrals to XYZ company when I get these messages because I do know people that are looking for a job that fit that skill set. And so I'll send them right over to that recruiter. So really, it's a win win for you as the manager sending this message out to a prospect, either you're going to get their interest and they're going to talk to you and you're gonna recruit them, or they're going to send you someone else that's possibly qualified for the position and you're gonna be able to recruit them. It's a win-win. And you have, you're building up your LinkedIn network. Maybe they're not interested in XYZ company today, but things change, right? People change, their careers change. And they remember, oh man, I got, you know what? A year ago, Steven sent me a message from XYZ Company. He was really impressed with my skills. At the time, I was really happy with my job, but now I can't stand my freaking boss. I can't stand my job anymore. I'm going to call Steven. Isn't that great? It, it works. LinkedIn works. Use it. We are all on social media. We are all using our phones to connect these days. Why are you not using LinkedIn? as your main recruiting resource. Why? Oh, because your company tells you not to. Your company says, use this, this hiring portal. We're gonna do some ads and Indeed and ZipRecruiter and career blah, blah, blah. But guess what? People that are worth hiring are not on ZipRecruiter. They're not on Indeed. They have a job. You need to find them where they are at. That is why LinkedIn works. All right, let's move on, shall we? Let's talk about some, now that we've found some candidates, right? Let's move into some interviewing techniques that actually work, all right? Once you've determined the right applicants, you still need to interview them for the position. Now, I'm sure many of you that are watching this training right now can look back at some of your best hires and some of your worst. And I know you appreciate the lessons that you've learned from that process. I know I've learned a lot. 
Now, I believe if you use the these recruiting techniques below that we're going to talk, go through this interview guide that we're about to discuss, you will avoid some of the headaches of hiring the wrong person 90% of the time. Now, I can't guarantee you won't hire someone that doesn't work out, okay? I can't make that guarantee. You will always have someone that pulls one over you, but I do know these principles will help you more times than not, more times in the company guide that you get, okay? Now, let's go through the, the interview guide. Principle one, listen twice as much as you talk. What's that? Listen twice as much as you talk during the interview process. Don't brag about the company. You've got them in the interview. They already know about the company. They probably spent last night maybe an hour on Google looking everything up they could find on your on your company. They're on glassdoor.com looking at the interview guide that you know hundreds of employees have already put out there of how this is the questions that are asked in the interview. They are prepared for the interview and if they're not and that freaking interview right there quit wasting your time with them come on really are you gonna just sit there and brag about your company for the next hour that's not how you interview i know you know that but most of you do it stop it <laughs> stop it save your company benefits for the end of the conversation after you are deterrent you you are 100 percent convinced that they're the right person for the position then you start selling the benefits, but you do it in a different way, okay? Next, listen to understand. Ask probing questions. This is where you peel back the onion. I'm gonna use this analogy of peeling back the onion through almost all the training modules because it's so important. When you ask them a question, peel it back. Keep asking, why? How does that make you feel? Tell me more. It's really important that you ask these questions because it will bring out their critical thinking skills. Speaking of critical thinking skills, you need to give them case studies so you can see how they will respond. You need to really understand what's going on in that head of theirs to see if they're going to be a good fit. You wanna closely analyze how they handle each situation. So write down you know, three math questions and ask them to solve it without using a calculator, okay? I got ahead of myself. There we go. Keep doing it. So let's just say, you know, the first one should be easy to easy to solve. Some kind of register, you know, something they would have to deal with at the register. Second question should be a little tougher, but most can answer. Okay. And the last one should be an advanced uh, one that's an advanced math question. You want to see how people react when they don't know the answer. They didn't prepare for that question, right? It wasn't on glassdoor.com. They didn't know you were going to ask some case studies. Now they're just you you've got them a little messed up there. They're like, "Oh crap, I didn't I didn't realize this was this was going to happen." And and that's that's real life, right? Your people are going to be approached with things they've never ever have seen before. They've never been approached with before. They they're put in situations that they just don't know how to handle. So when you can bring a little bit of that out in the interview in a positive way, you can start analyzing that person to see if they're going to handle your customers appropriately and handle the stress of the job appropriately. So one advanced math question you could do is something that's gross margin related. For example, this is a case study I would I, I give to tons of my inter, people that I'm interviewing. If a t-shirt has a cost of $9 and you want a gross margin of 45%, what should be the suggested retail price? Well, obviously I'm not gonna give them this answer at the bottom, that formula. By the way, this is a for, one of the formulas, one of the, one of the many formulas we teach in our advanced uh, retail math course that's in, I believe, uh, week four, week three or four of the, of the academy. You don't wanna miss that training. You, you real, these, are, these are formulas that most managers don't know. Even, I found, a ton of district managers that don't even know basic retail math formulas. This one in particular, the cost complement formula. And, and again, it goes back to the question. So going back to the case study, if it, this t-shirt has a cost of $9 and you want a gross margin of 45%, what should be the suggested retail price? Most of them are going to do a markup formula, okay, where they're doing 
the cost was it times 100 plus the the desired margin percent so 45 so 1.45 nine dollars times 1.45 they're not going to get a gross margin of 45 dollars they have to use the co cost complement which is below so again you'll be really i'll be really impressed if someone gets this right when i'm interviewing doesn't happen very often but what i'm really looking for is how they're responding to the stress of not knowing the answer not having a clue of how to answer this question you want you i don't care if they get the answer right come on guys do you care no you care how they handle the stress of not knowing are are they friendly about it like oh steven oh my gosh that's an awesome question i have no idea how to solve but if you teach me that man i will master it today okay that's someone that I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll consider hiring, right? If they pass on my other interview stuff. But this is the type of case studies you want to do. You want to do situational case studies. If you were placed in this situation, these were the resources you had. This was this was this is what you have to deal with. What do you do next? What's the next five things that you do? And then you closely analyze how they would handle it, and you analyze just their critical thinking you analyze how they handle it. The more stress you can put on them in the questions and, and, and the more the better the interview is going to be when it comes to you finding the right person for the position, okay? All right, moving on here. Let's see. It's not what you say, but how you say it. It's not what you say, but how they say it, right? For example, if I ask someone why they would consider leaving their current employer to work for us and they give me a really solid answer, but the tone of, the vo of their voice and body language paints a completely different story, I'm going to really focus on that question and I'm gonna keep digging in, I'm gonna digging in, I'm gonna peel back the onion. Nine out of 10 times, I'll get the truth out of what was never even close to the answer they gave me, right? Now, moving on, address the red flags in their resume. Address the red flags that you that you discover as you're interviewing them. I wanna review, review some of the red flags that you will come across and how you can address them. So let's start out with red flags in their resume, okay? Let's see, gaps of employment. It's a big red flag, right? How do you address that? Well, you, you ask a pointed, pointed question. I noticed you were unemployed for a year in between the last two employers. Tell me why. Short durations in their last employers. You were with this employer for only four months. Why? Well, you know, I just, it wasn't the right fit. Don't accept that answer. Oh, okay, really? It wasn't the right fit? That's interesting. Hmm. What? If you don't mind, tell me why why it wasn't the right fit. Well, you know, it, it's just when I signed on, I thought it was going to be one thing, and, and it actually was another. It's still another generic answer. Oh, okay, I see. Now, what was that one thing you thought it was going to be? Well, I thought it was this. And then what did you? And what did it end up being? Well, it ended up being this situation, this this type of job. Oh, okay. And why was it that you couldn't handle that? What? Why? Why didn't you like it? So that's that's pulling back the un, peeling back the onion, addressing the red flag, change in their job title. Did they go from department manager to part time hourly CSM or hourly associate? That's a red flag, right? Why did they get demoted? Unemployed obviously is a red flag. I, I don't have anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with people that have been unemployed. Okay, just keep that in mind. But it can be a red flag. You. It's, it's a flag that you at least have to address. You've got to, you've got to you know, call out the, the elephant in the room and, and find out why they were unemployed, okay? Find out the situation as best that you can and see if it's applicable to what you're looking for in a candidate. Someone that has low interests, right? They're in the interview and they're just, they act like they just don't care. They're not interested. That's a red flag. You're going to have high turnover. If you hire someone that's not really interested, maybe they're just trying to find just some extra income 
as they're looking for actually the real job that they want. You don't want that. You don't want to spend all that time and training and effort with someone that's not interested. They're not going to give their best. And then, and then they're going to quit maybe a month from now. Inconsistent answers is a huge red flag. I'm a big fan of asking the same, like if I get an inconsistent answer, I'll, I'll maybe continue in my interview, but I make a note to ask that question again, maybe in a slightly different variation because I want to see what kind of answer I get. And most times it's very inconsistent with the first. It's a huge red flag. All right, be sure you carefully and skillfully address each red flag until the answers are satisfactory. All right, do more than one interview. I know many of you that do your own recruiting and in many cases will just hire someone without sending them through the interview process. Stop that. You will find a lot of your turnover happens from people that you did not send through the interview process. It's not a good idea. First, you need to interview the candidate, and if they do well, have the manager from the department they are going into interview them. Makes sense, right? Then meet with that manager and share notes. If you were both on the same page, start the reference checks. Now I know, don't, don't start with me, Stephen. I know you think reference checks are a waste of time. Trust me, I thought this too. I thought for a long time that what reference checks were just a waste of time, but until I had to actually fax proof of my reference checks on, the, on one of the managers I was interviewing, until I had to do that, that's the moment I that that day changed everything. This guy was 100% going to be the best higher, well, well, I'm skipping here, uh, but anyways, this guy I thought was going to be the best hire I ever found. He had a solid resume. He interviewed like a champ, said everything that I wanted to hear. I offered him the max pay and I was ready to move forward. Then my HR manager asked me to fax in the interview form and notes from the reference checks. I thought, crap, I better call his references. I don't want to be you know, looking like that, that type of manager. And I was shocked that, you know, the HR manager wanted notes from the reference checks. They've never done that before. I was so glad. I was so glad they did. So I get on the phone, call the two references he had. I begin to ask the normal, generic, never helpful questions of what's your relationship to this candidate, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, uh, you, you're, cons you know, you know, would, it, would you uh, rehire this person if you had the chance? And then I remember his employer, his manager was like, he got all quiet. He's like, oh, you're, uh, <clears throat> um, you're considering Josh? I'm like, yeah, I am. Yeah, I can't, you know, this guy, he's, he's just, he's going to be awesome. I'm sure he did a great job for you, right? And he's like, well, uh, I can't say much about Josh. You know, all I can really say is that he worked here for a year and uh, he doesn't work here anymore. It's never good when you get a O oh, and I can't say much about it except for he worked here for these dates. I knew after I knew I knew right then something was wrong with this candidate, because if I got the same call from another manager considering an employee I just fired, I, you know, legally, I can't really say what happened, right? All I can't say much. All I can say is that he worked here from July 2011 to August of 2013. That's all I can say. And I probably wouldn't hire him if you asked me that question too, okay? That is why reference checks are so important. That, that reference checks have saved my tail countless times from hiring the wrong person. The person I thought was just incredible. I thought this person was going to be my my golden boy, right? My golden child, but turns out they were just great at interviewing. And a lot of people are skillful interviewers at being interviewed, but are not don't actually have any real skills in the position you're hiring for. Okay. All right. Um, let me move on here. So here's some uh, here's some questions you can ask 
during reference checks. So, and I'm gonna the, these are these might change from time to time as laws change, right? But so if you're watching this right now, some of these questions might not even work. But I'm just gonna quickly go through a few of them just just to give you an idea of, of questions that I use during my reference checks that I so I can really get a firm understanding of this employee, the person I'm considering. So just simple, what are some of the candidate's strengths? What are some of the candidate's weaknesses? If the candidate has a weakness, do you believe the candidate can overcome with, within the first 90 days of his training? Did the candidate receive any promotions while with your company? Why or why not? Does the candidate have good listening and communication skills? Did the candidate mainly work independently or with a group of people? Was the candidate, a, I'm, I'm getting so ahead of myself. Was the candidate a valuable member of your company? Why did the candidate leave the position? Did you think the candidate is qualified for this job? Or do you think they're qualified for this job? Why or why not? How would you rate the candidate's overall performance from a scale to, of one to 10? That's a great question. Why should I hire this candidate? If, it, if they were extremely satisfied with that, that that employee they would they would go for they would go to bat and they would they would try to convince me why I need to hire this candidate and if they weren't very good they're not going to go to bat they're not going to tell me much all things aside would you rehire this candidate if you could all right so those are reference checks questions that I highly recommend you use, but check with the local laws and federal laws that change all the flipping time. Make sure that any of those questions that you ask are not illegal. You want to make sure they're legal, right? All right. Now, this is something, this concept I'm about to discuss with you is not known to many. This is what's going to set you apart as a retail leader. This is what's gonna set you apart in your organization if you do this next, this next part of this training. You are going to be a rock star retail leader. You are going to hire the right people. You're gonna get people that are overqualified to accept lower pay, and 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 lower benefits because of this concept. I call it the job offer kick start meeting. Now you don't need to call it that when you ask them to come in, but make sure you let them know up front that this could be an hour long meeting. It's all going to be, you know, hey, basically I need to follow up with you on a few things, a small interview, and then I need to have a small discussion. It might take an hour. That's all you need to say. Don't say job offer kickstart meeting because they're going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, you know, I'm not ready to accept the job yet. Okay. Just, just simply say, Hey, I've got a, I have a few follow up interview questions and I've got a couple other things I need to discuss with you. It's important. It might take an hour. Can you, what's a good time to come in, you know, today or tomorrow? All right. Now, this, uh, this meeting is designed to prep the candidate for what's to come and to make sure everyone is on the same page. You're not going to say that over the phone, but that is what it's, that's the purpose. Okay. So the first thing that you do is actually write up your offer. Be sure to include the employee's name, right? That's simple. Hourly or their salary rate, any related bonus structure, start date, give them two weeks, you know, for that start date. Uh, that may need to change if the employee needs more time. You may need to get HR to actually write this up for you. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but make sure it's all written up. I, okay, I want to I emphasize this again, writing up the offer. Even though it might be a team lead you're hiring at $10 an hour, write up an offer. It changes the game. Most companies don't write up job offers for these lower to mid-level management positions or even hourly part-time associate positions. It doesn't happen out there. But when you're recruiting someone that is extremely talented and you want them on your team and you're recruiting them from another business, another competitor, you will do this. You will write up the offer and it will make the difference. It will set you on top, it will make it will make the difference. 
Okay. Next, um, write up a training timeline with dates, topics, and trainers. Why would you do that? Why would you spend all that time when they haven't accepted the offer yet? It's because they see you put so much effort into, and, and you've really thought it out. You've written it out on paper, what they're going, what not only their offer, but their training, their timeline that has dates, topics, and even trainers. When you put that much time into an offer, not an acceptance, but an offer, they will feel obligated to actually accept the offer. It's kind of like when you go to, I, I hate to, I hate to, <laughs> probably won't go, you know, it's, it's, it's just like when you're, when you're a salesman, a car salesman offers you a bottle of water or some pizza when you're just looking. Once they know, once you accept that, that they've got you because for whatever reason, you receive something free and now you feel obligated to actually spend the time with them exploring all options and even buying a car from them. It's just like that you just feel obligated for whatever reason. Now, it's a little bit different with a job offer, right? But there is some feeling there, some emotional connection where, you know what? This manager really wants to invest in me. I feel important. That 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 prospect, that 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 uh, prospective employee feels important. Important enough that you wrote up an offer and a training timeline that's very detailed. They're going to like that in a boss and they'll they've never seen that before in any other company they've interviewed for and accepted jobs job offers with so you have now really set yourself apart from the competition does that make sense okay so once you've written all this up put it all together obviously the next step is to call the person in make them the offer and quickly go into the training timeline we just talked about and then have them sign the offer. Now you're probably wondering why I should put all this together before I've even accepted the offer. And if they say no, what if they say no? I'm, I'm out all of that time. People that are on the fence when it comes to leaving a good company to join yours will appreciate the hard work and attention to detail and will feel obligated to accept your offer. Okay, that's it. Above... That's it, guys. Really, I mean, isn't that doesn't isn't that very different from what you're doing right now? I hope so. If you're doing this, I would you better send me a message. I, I'm gonna hire you. <laughs> you, this is what sets you apart. Above all else, you know, when when it comes to recruiting, just use your best judgment. If someone feels off, right, trust your gut and verify. Verify through the reference checks. Verify through the interview process. Okay. Trust your gut. I hope this helped you. I'll see you on the next training where we're going to discuss the proper way of letting employees go and what not to do. All right. In this training, I'll be actually there talking to you in front of the camera, really give you a solid foundation of what to do and what not to do. Thanks for watching this training. Don't forget, we have our weekly conference call where you can actually email me a question, a specific question with the problem that you're facing, and I will answer your question directly on the call. Don't forget to engage on our Facebook group as well. You've got a community of store managers and district managers that are there to support you, to help you. This is the type of community I wish I had as a store manager, where I could just send in a question and boom, I get an answer on a conference call. I get an answer from all my peers on Facebook. I'm not judged for it. That is what managers need. That is what I needed and I didn't get. That's what you're going to get. And it's going to set you apart from the competition. It's going to help you be successful very quickly. Thanks for watching this lesson. I'll see you on the next module.